Hello everyone. Hello. Wonderful to see you all. For those watching at home, we have just read together the entirety of Ezekiel chapter 32. So please pause this video now and do that yourself before following on with us. And don't forget to like and share this video. Right, shall we commit this meeting to the Lord together? Let's pray. Loving and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Ezekiel, this ancient text that has survived over two and a half thousand years and is as relevant today than ever before. We thank you that the Bible is a living word and that it is true. And we pray that you will speak to us through it today. Amen. 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 So we now come, some of you will be pleased to know, the end of this rather gruesome and graphic section in Ezekiel that deals with the judgment of Egypt. The date in verse 1 is the 5th of March, 585 BC. And all the themes over recent studies that, that have looked into God's judgment of Egypt, they are repeated and summarised here in chapter 32. Ezekiel, who, as we know, is the master of metaphor, he brings back here the crocodile analogy from chapter 29. Do you remember it in chapter 29? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'll remember that he described Pharaoh as such a beast and depicted how God would fish him out of the river and leave him for dead to be eaten by the vultures. Now that is an horrific insult to the king of a culture that so values burial, to be left out to die and be, be eaten by wild animals. In chapter 32, Ezekiel then builds on this imagery and he uh, uses echoes here of the plagues of Egypt, plagues that you'll read about in Exodus 7 and Exodus 10. And what we've got here, as we've read together, is a rather gruesome and bloody scene. Verse 6, we're told that the ravines will be filled with flesh. That's horrific, isn't it? And that darkness will overcome. What we have here again is apocalyptic language. We're talking here about the destruction of the heavens, which for the Egyptians at the time was true for them. Verse 11, the sword of Babylon is coming against you. Then we have verse 24 and verse 25, they will bear your shame. And Ezekiel tells the Egyptians that you will be, verse 22, verse 23, verse 25, verse 26, verse 27, Verse 28, verse 29, verse 30, God's making a point for us here, isn't he? That verse 31, verse 32, you will be killed by the sword. But this imagery here, used by Ezekiel, which was timely for the Egyptians, who suffered this, this most horrific and gruesome fate, this, this imagery, it also fast-forwards us to our day of judgment. Ezekiel uses here the exact same language as is used in Joel 3, the same language used in Amos 5, the same language Jesus uses in Matthew 24. Because the message of Ezekiel, the, the message that Ezekiel is giving here to the Egyptians was not simply for the Egyptians for their, for their day and generation. This message is also for us. Amen? 
Ezekiel is looking forward to the ultimate day of judgment, as well as the judgment of Egypt. And what is the message that he, that he is presenting to Egypt and to us today? Well, it's quite a simple message. It's that God is just. Can you say that with me? God is, is just. just. And because he's just, he will act judge, justly. Because he is just, he will come and he will destroy all evil. Amen? So we need to repent and we need to run to Jesus. That's the message. What Ezekiel prophesied here about Egypt, it happened, it really happened in history. Not only is it recorded in the scriptures for us today, which is the highest authority, but these events that we read of, they're supported by the Babylonian Chronicle and many other historical texts outside of scripture. We have archaeological evidence to prove these events. And we have chronological evidence because we know that there were regime changes during this time. Egypt is still suffering today from this mini apocalypse because it's no longer the superpower it once was, is it? They're still licking their wounds from this today. These events that, that Ezekiel prophesied here, they are in the textbooks, they are in the history books, they are in encyclopedias. What Ezekiel prophesied here is all true. Every word of it happened. Google it when you get home. These events are true. Say that with me. These mm -hmm. events are true. And through their historical truth, these events should still teach us truth today. And it's that simple message again. Say that with me. God is just. God, God is just. just. So he will act justly. He is coming to destroy evil. So we all must repent. We must run to Jesus. Amen? As I've said many times from the pulpit, being a Christian is not about believing in, in blind faith. That's not Christianity. Christianity is not a fairy tale or a myth. It's not, not mysticism. To be a Christian is to believe in facts. Amen? Mm -hmm. Historical facts, such as the fall of Egypt, recorded for us here in Ezekiel 32. This is fact. Facts that give us clear lessons of the reality of the judgment of God to the people of Egypt at the time. And not just to Egypt, all their neighbours that we've read about here. And because it's historical fact, its history still speaks to us today. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. As Christians, we must approach the Bible, these ancient texts, not in some kind of pagan naivety, not in some kind of mysticism, or in some kind of vain hope for, for some uplifting wisdom, we must come to these texts in the mindset that as, as real as the historical judgment of Egypt was, so will our judgment be. And this should really concern us greatly. And it should drive us to holiness. This really happened. Amen? Amen. And so will our judgment. We're told in verse 2 that Pharaoh describes himself here as a lion. And he thought that when he exercised his power in what he believed in, he was doing an honourable act. But how did God see Pharaoh? He saw him as a crocodile. A swamp lizard. 
muddying up, fouling the, the rivers and the waters. In the same way as Christians, we may think that we're doing okay. We come to church, we give to charity, we read our Bibles, we pray, we watch Bible studies like this on YouTube. Aren't we good Christians? Pat yourselves on the back. But to God, from his perspective of perfect holiness, at best, we are just swamp lizards stirring up the mud. Pharaoh thought he was a lion. God saw a crocodile. And God is our judge. We're not our judge. God is our judge. And only he decides who is clean enough for heaven. And we live in the mud. Can you see why, why this historical account should concern us? Yeah? One of my favourite preachers is a guy called Paul Washer. Have you heard of Paul Washer? He's brilliant. Look him up. If you're watching online, go to Paul Washer after this video. He's a favourite of mine. Now he describes a time when he was on mission in South America, in the rainforests. And he met a people who, for food, would go into the river and put their hands into the mud banks. And they would essentially go go hunting in the, in the cold, wet, muddy water with their bare hands and they would dig into the bank of the side of the river and they would pull out these disgusting, slimy eels that were white, utterly pale and they were blind because they never see the light of day. They don't need to see. They were awful, ugly things pulled out of the grime and the murk and the mud and, and the utter darkness of these wet, disgusting riverbanks. And Paul Washer says, in our sin, before our holy God, we appear so much worse than these ugly, ugly creatures. Verse 2, Pharaoh thought he was a lion. But God saw him as a mud-stirring swamp monster. And this entire chapter is a lament. We're told that, aren't we? In verse 2, Son of man, raise a, la la a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt. What we've got here is Ezekiel grieving over the utter disillusionment of the people of Egypt. They were blind to the facts before them. They could not see the errors of their ways. They were people who, who thought they were good enough. And as a result, they did not turn from their evil. So they met with the consequences of their own cho choices, which is death by the sword, amen? In this case. And judgment. In the same way, we Christians, we must grieve for those outside the church. Those in our valley who are just lost. Who think they're doing okay. Who think they're lions in their little worlds. We must lament for them. We must grieve for their souls. But not in a way that looks down upon them. But in a way that, that pleads with the Holy Spirit to, to come today and open their eyes to the reality of their status before the living Holy God. And in this request, we must understand how gracious God has been to each one of us to show us the reality of our own ugliness, our own selfishness, our own greed, our own lust, our own pride. We must pray that that the Holy Spirit will, will reveal to us that before a thrice holy God, we are just as broken, just as ugly, before God as anyone else in this valley, Christian or not. Writhing in our own anguish in the mud. Paul says in Romans, doesn't he, quoting Isaiah, our best efforts are but filthy rags. Amen? 
As Christians, we must learn from history what God does to those who abandon love, what God does to those who abandon life and charity for selfish gain. And see such ugliness in ourselves so that we will repent and flee to Jesus. Amen? Jesus the Christ, say his name with me. Jesus the Christ, whom on the cross, he took our ugliness onto himself, didn't he? He took our shame, he took our darkness, that we, like those river hills in South America, just, just love to hide in. He took it all. He took all that mud and all that grime, he took it all onto himself, and by his blood, he has washed us clean, amen? And in washing us clean, he presents us perfect and righteous to God. So that when he looks down at us, he doesn't see a swamp monster. He sees lions of truth. Sons and daughters of the king. Amen? All by grace. So that we can, we can begin a new life in that faith of the historical truth as beautiful redeemed creatures in his service leaving our old sinful lives behind empowered by the holy spirit to live in you amen, amen. fresh start beautiful as christians if we build our lives on what jesus did for us on the cross if we build our lives on, on the revelation of truth that, that pierces through the muddy waters, if we build our lives on the historical events of, of Easter, if we build our lives on the historical events such as what Ezekiel has given us here in chapter 32, we will be constantly reminded that God acts justly through history. He is a just God, amen. If we build our lives on these realities, we will be constantly and healthily reminded of the ugliness of our sin. So ugly was our sin that it butchered the radiance of God's glory. And in being reminded of this truth, we are also reminded of God's grace that, that not only took such ugliness away from us, but also gave us his perfect righteousness. So that in faith today, when we call upon God, as we're about to do now in prayer, through the cross, God will not see us by who we are in nature, swamp monsters stirring up the mud. But again, he will see us through the cross as lions of truth and love. Clothed in, in Christ's righteousness, clothed in his majesty, clothed, clothed in his, his perfection from above. Who wants to be forgiven? Who wants to be washed clean? Who wants to be redeemed? Who wants to be eternally cherished by the living God? Just got to receive Jesus. And all that muck's gone away. Amen? Amen? It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? The good news is, it is true. <laughs> Hallelujah! Amen. Sometimes it seems too hard to accept. But you must. Because that's the gospel. Amen. Amen.